into the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to sing to the Lord this morning. We're going to make His praise louder than any storm or any problem that you may be going to today. So let's sing together this morning. There's a song that cannot be contained. There's a shout that breaks through every chain. God, we won't be silent. To the There's a joy that chases the dark away, but we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. Lift your voices, lift your voices, lift your voices. Make it pray so glorious, glorious. Lift your voices. Chases the turn away, but we won't be silent. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. And the greater the storm, the louder our song. With our voices, with our voices, make it play so glorious, glorious. With our voices, with our voices, make it play so glorious. Let us all sing it. 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 Let our voices make a praise so glorious, glorious. Let our voices, let our voices make a praise so glorious. Let our voices, let our voices make a praise so glorious, glorious. Let our voices, let our voices make a praise so glorious. And the greater the storm, the louder the song. And the greater the storm, the louder the song. And the sun sinks, and the sun sinks, and the sun sinks, and the sun sinks.
the louder your song ought to be. The greater my storm, the louder our song ought to be. I try to remind him of Psalm chapter 46, and the Bible says these words. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble, but there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. In other words, there is a perpetual stream that is continually making glad the city of God, even in the midst of the mountains rising and the storms rising and the earth shaking. No matter what's happening in our world around us, and I know that when we go from week to week, especially all over the world, but especially in the United States of America, when we listen to things like the coronavirus, and we think about it in China and spreading to different parts across the earth, when we think about just the political turmoil of the United States of America, I'm glad that I can go to the Word of God, which says to me, God is our refuge, and God is our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Let's give the Lord Jesus Christ another great big praise. He is our refuge. He is our strength. So, Lord, today, we recognize that if you are our refuge and our strength in the big problems of the world, and the cosmos, even the mountain shaking, Lord, we also recognize that you are our refuge in our own personal storms of life. Today, as people have come in across this sanctuary, or perhaps are listening via the internet, Lord, we want to say to you that we recognize that even though we may be going through a storm, you are our refuge. And the greater our storm, the louder our song will be. So help us to make your praise louder and more glorious than we've ever made it before. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. And together, God's people said... Amen and amen. We welcome you to the house of the Lord, to Stephen P.H. Church today. You're with us as a guest, and we always have guests almost every single Sunday. My name is Alan Mayo. I'm the lead pastor here. We just want to say a great big welcome to you. We're glad you're in the house of the Lord. You may have by now even spotted a couple of people that you recognize that you know from around the area. Whether you did or didn't. We want you to take just about uh, two or three minutes and just get around to a couple of people and welcome them to the house of the Lord today. Take a few moments to fellowship. Stop singing. Stop singing. 
Aren't you glad this morning that we have blessed assurance in Jesus Christ today? If everybody believes that, can you just raise your hand and say, Thank you, Jesus, for your assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is
to bear, so I cast my cares upon the Lord. This weary road I've traveled for so long, would you take my hand and lead me on? Oh, my God. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Lord, we feel your spirit in this place, and we thank you for that, Lord. We know that where we are gathered, you are here with us, Lord, and we thank you again for being with us. Lord, just as we sang, no matter what we're going through, we know that you are working things for our good. Help us to remember that, whether it may be sickness or spiritual sickness or emotional sickness, whatever we're going through, Lord, let us rely on you and know that you did not give it to us to handle on our own that you are with us and when you told us to cast our burdens on you for you will care for us. We are thankful for that today, Lord. We are thankful for your healing touch as we continue to pray for Evan Faircloth and Shannon Carswell. We are claiming today, Lord, full healing, healing in your name. We know that you are able and you are going to do that today, Lord. We thank you for this service and thank you for bringing us all here together, Lord. We pray for Pastor Allen as he brings the word. We pray that we would have open ears and open hearts to hear what it is you have to say to us today, Lord. Lord, be with the leaders that we have in this church, in this community, in our state, and in our nation. In a time where it seems like we need you more than ever, Lord, we do. We need you, Heavenly Father, to take over and take control. And even in that area, let us continue to rely on you, Lord, and know that you are in control. Dear Lord, we thank you again for being in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You are working all things for my good. Yeah. You are working all things for my good. When I cannot see it, God, I still believe that you are working all things for my good. standing the entire time. I didn't get a witness there, and I sensed the reason for that. I, I thought I might get an amen, but all I heard was no. Wow, we are so glad to have you in the house of the Lord today. We've got some wonderful things that are going to be taking place throughout the service, and um, our praise and worship time just kind of moved through flowingly and beautifully doesn't mean there's not a lot left that God wants to say to us. We have obviously the Lord's Supper we will be receiving at the end of the service. We also have a special couple in our church that we will be, as it were, recommissioning today. Reverend Michael Couillard and Mary Ellen. Today, this will be their last Sunday with us. They've been with us for about three years. Kind of took a sabbatical of about three years. and um, But recently they sensed the Lord calling them back into the pastoral ministry, uh, at least for a season, to help out a particular church that they were actually a part of a number of years ago, but kind of has fallen on some difficult times. And uh, we're going to, at the end of the service, we're going to be bringing you all up after the communion time, and we are going to be recommissioning them along with this congregation. Aren't you thankful that God knows how to send shepherds to congregations exactly when they're needed? Amen? Amen. 
You should take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 and starting verse number 25. And it's a long chapter, so we'll break the chapter down into pieces and not read all of it. But I do want you to hear the word of the Lord today, and I want you to receive the context of where the message is going to be coming from today. John chapter 6, verses 25, and uh, we will read through... Uh, Verse 35 to start with, and then I'll give you directions after that. So if you will hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 6, starting at verse number 25. And when they, the crowd, had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to Jesus, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, it became because you ate your fill of the loaves. For Jesus had just performed the miracle of feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. And so they followed him all the way around the sea looking for Jesus. And he says to them in verse 26 again, I read it, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on Him that God the Father has set His seal. And then they said to Him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him in whom He has sent. So they said to Him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? In other words, you just performed one miracle a little while ago, but we'd like to see another one. We were really not sure. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus answered them and said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this kind of bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then in verse 41, Then the Jews began to complain about Jesus because he said, I am and the bread that came down from heaven. In verse 52, if you'll flip over, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. And then verse 66, our last verse. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you for the word of God today. Lord, what was difficult in that day for the Jews who had been raised in the, the traditions and the rituals of Moses were confounded by the word of Jesus Christ that day. Lord, we pray that you will take and open up our ears. Holy Spirit, we need you to activate this voice that is speaking. Activate the ears that are hearing, the spirit and the soul and the mind, that we may receive what is for us from your word today. Lord, we thank you for 
not only the written word, but Jesus, for you, for you are the living word, the bread of life, who has come down from heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray, and everyone said together, amen and amen. You may be seated in this place. We are just two weeks, two Sundays away from finishing our series that we've been in over the last number of weeks, really since the beginning of the year. That series has been a series called Balanced Faith, or Balancing Your Faith. And the takeaway of the series has been only a balanced faith keeps us from overemphasizing one orthodox tradition or stream of the church at the expense of another. I want to say that again because it's important that when you leave this place in, in two Sundays that you will understand that what we have shared over these last number of weeks since the beginning of the year is merely the beginning. It's merely a foundation for where I believe the Holy Spirit is leading the church here into the future. I believe that the entire body of Christ is in need of retrieving those strong, fundamental, orthodox streams of the faith that, have, that were actually flowing out of Jesus Christ himself and that have actually flowed through the church down through history, although there have been different seasons when those streams may, even though God wanted them to flow freely, may not have flown as freely through the church as we should have allowed them. Perhaps even denominations have allowed certain streams to flow through them but have been reticent or reluctant to allow the other streams, the great orthodox streams of the church, to flow through them. And so because of that, the Bible says to us, Jesus, in some of the last words you last spoke in red letters, in your red letter edition of the Bible in the book of Revelation, said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So in light of that today, I want you to understand that over the last six Sundays, seven altogether about the last six Sundays, we have been talking about having a balanced faith and understanding the streams of the faith that flow through the church. And I gave them to you, we'll give them to you, I think they're going to be on the screen for you, but I'll give them to you just very quickly again. There is the, the social justice stream, also known as the compassionate life. There is the contemplative stream, also known as the prayer-filled life. We have talked about the contemplative stream. We'll talk about social justice in our last one next week. We talked about the holiness stream, that is the virtuous life. We talked about the charismatic stream, also known as the spirit-empowered life. We talked about the evangelical stream last week, also known as the word-centered life. And today we are going to talk about what may be one of the most difficult in non-sacramental churches of all. The sacramental stream, also known as the incarnational life. In other words, if you perhaps grew up in an evangelical church or evangelical Pentecostal church or evangelical Pentecostal Holiness church or perhaps a, 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 a Methodist church or particularly some of the non-mainline denominations, you may not be as familiar with the sacramental stream. But I'm here to share with you that God wants all of the streams flowing through us because there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And so in light of that, we have to understand that we must be prepared to hear what it is that the Spirit is saying to the church. And the Spirit will always take us back to the Word. The Spirit will always take us back to the Word of God. And we also need to be aware that the Spirit speaks even through even the early church fathers as well, and the tradition of the church, not traditions, but the capital T, tradition of the church, so that we can have an understanding of what was it that the, the early church fathers understood the apostles to be saying, and Jesus to be saying. And so today I want to talk to you about the sacramental stream of the church, and there's a definition that I want to give to you that you can write down. Also, please always know, I'm always told, please say this, Please, inside of your app, on our church app, you will find sermon notes that have a lot of this that's already there, and you can take notes right there. Or at least have it so you can flow through it while you're taking your handwritten notes. But let me give you the sacramental stream of the church definition. Here it is. The orthodox stream that reminds us that the ascended Christ continues to be present with the church through the material means of water and baptism and bread and wine in Eucharist. 
Let me say that again. It's the orthodox stream that reminds us that the ascended Christ continues to be present with the church, especially through the material means of water in baptism and bread and wine in the Eucharist. And that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus desires, I, I believe this, if you want to write one thing down today, I would write this one down. Jesus desires to be present with his church. Jesus desires to be present with his church. How many of you are looking forward to the day when Jesus actually comes back from heaven, brings heaven to earth, and he is back here with us and we are together with him? Would you say a great big amen? We look forward to that day. Jesus looks forward to that day when the Father says, Bam, now's the time. Go. Go. But in the meantime, we need to understand Jesus still desires to be present with us, even now, present with the community of saints that is already in heaven, but also present with the community of saints that remains on earth. Because before Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised his followers this. He promised them that he would continue to be present with his people, his church, through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. Think about this from Matthew chapter 28, 19, 20, if you want to write it down or look at it perhaps. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Don't know that it'll be up on the screen, but listen to it. And Jesus, after his resurrection, came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus said, I am going to go. I'm going away, and yet I'm still going to be present with you. I'm going away, and yet I will still be present with you. What was he talking about? Well, if we go back and we look in John, Especially in John chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, we will find that Jesus introduced to his disciples the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit will come. He will be your comforter. He is going to be the one that is present within you and within the church. But how is Jesus going to be present within his church when his physical body was about to ascend and return to heaven? How was Jesus going to be at two places at one time? How was Jesus going to be in heaven and on earth at the same time. Jesus said, first and foremost, he would continue to be present in individual believers through the person of the Holy Spirit that the Father and Son would sit on the day of Pentecost. This is what Jesus said in John 15. They began to understand over time what Jesus was saying. In John chapter 15, he says these words, <clears throat> If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 15. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth. This is the Holy Spirit whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him because He abides with you and He will be in you. Everybody say, He will be in you. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, Father and I will send the Holy Spirit when you are believers in Jesus Christ, when you believe in me, you will have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Jesus continues and says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. Ooh. Do you notice we just said that? I'm not leaving you orphaned. I'm coming to you. Yeah, but you're going away. You're going to heaven. Yeah, but I'm coming to you. How am I, how am I, how am I coming to them? How is he coming to them? He's coming in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus continues to be present in heaven and on earth at the same time, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now we understand that. You go, Pastor, that's nothing new. I get it. Been there, done that. You called me out of my bed this morning just to tell me that. I know that. I'm glad that you do. We always need to be reminded, and there may be a few who are not aware of that. So I want to drive it a little bit deeper here today. But Jesus also said there will be two times in particular where he is physically present with his body of believers collectively. Jesus said he will be physically present at the waters of baptism, and the wine and the bread of the Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist. This is why the church worldwide recognizes water baptism and the Eucharist as sacraments 
instituted by Christ. Some churches call them ordinances, but sacraments instituted by Christ. Jesus wanted us to understand that water baptism is essential. The Holy Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion is absolutely essential. And there are streams within the body of Christ who have taken that. I can tell you that even in my own time of growing up, and I am thankful for my heritage, let me let you know. But I want to tell you that in my own heritage and even in my own schooling, and I went to a denominational college and I went to that schooling, but there was very little talk about water baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so as a result of that, I myself in my own ministry paid less attention to the very two things that Jesus said were perhaps some of the most important. They were definitely essential. Water baptism. We've even gotten to the point where in many denominations that we don't baptize believers in Jesus Christ anymore. When there are congregations, I can tell of you, some of them would go, I'm not sure I could tell you the last time we had the Lord's Supper. And part of that is because there is not a deep appreciation for what Jesus was instituting. I can tell you, and I want to be perfectly honest with you and up front, I don't even completely understand all the metaphysical, spiritual realities that flow through water baptism and through the taking of the Lord's Supper. But what I am learning is this. I need to be in hot pursuit of understanding what the presence of God wants to do in those two particular acts that Christ instituted. Be in hot pursuit. Step into the street. I feel like a lot of times when I listen, when it came time to talk about sacrament, the sacramental stream, we saved it to the end, not because, you know, it was just, you know, we want to save it to the end, but because I feel like I'm a baby when I'm stepping into it, into an understanding of it. You remember what we said a few, few weeks ago when we talked about Ezekiel? He said, the Spirit of the Lord and the angel of the Lord led Ezekiel and he went out in the waters that you know were up to ankle deep and then he said go a little bit further and it's knee deep and he said go a little bit further and I went further he said it was up to my waist took me a little bit further and as I got further along I was swimming in it let me tell you something when it comes to the sacramental stream this pastor will tell you I feel like I'm ankle deep I don't understand all that there is to understand about water baptism and about the Eucharist. You would say, but pastor, you're the pastor. Yes, but I grew up in a stream that did not emphasize this. And so as a result of that, I began to search the Scriptures and over the last couple of years, the Holy Spirit began to speak things into my spirit and I began to study and understand what it was that not only Scripture says, but what the early church did and how they practiced and how important the water baptism was and the Eucharist is to the early church and to even the early, in the early centuries, and not only the early centuries, but in reality, all through the centuries, from the time of Jesus Christ, even to the time of now, even if that stream wasn't always as prevalent in a lot of denominations. Now think about the fact that Peter himself said this about water baptism. On the day of Pentecost, listen to the words of his message. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized. What's that? Repent, every one of you, and be baptized. What was he saying? The importance of water baptism. Paul, when he is blinded by the light, and when he is taken in by Ananias, what are the words that are saying? Saul, you have come to me, the Lord's already spoken to me. You're coming in, and the Bible says that Paul, or Saul, was he believed and was baptized. All throughout church history we read about baptism. All throughout the scriptures we read about baptism and the importance of the washing of the waters. Washing of the waters by the Word. Who is the Word? It is Jesus Christ. He is the one stirring up the waters. I had the privilege of, or I had the honor actually, of being baptized by my own father. He was a pastor. About ten years ago he passed on. But we were in Washington, D.C. I'd given my heart and my life to Jesus Christ in Appomattox, Virginia. 
at a church that did not have a baptistry. And in one year, within one year, he was called from that, that little small church in Appomattox, Virginia, to a larger church in Washington, D.C. And we went there. And as we went there, he held one of the first baptism services that he had ever held. And he had, had only been a pastor at two churches. The first one didn't have a baptistry. The second one did. And I was one of the first individuals that he was able to baptize in water. It was my honor to be baptized by my father. I had the privilege then of having two daughters, Haley and Heidi. Haley's in the house today, not always able to be with us. She lives in Raleigh. But both of them made decisions for Jesus Christ when they were young. And when I was pastoring in Greenville, North Carolina, I had the privilege of being able to baptize both of my daughters in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I am so thankful that in spite of the fact I don't know everything there is to know about water baptism, that guess what? Jesus Christ was still present in that moment. And the Holy Spirit was activating those waters in such a way that there was a divine transaction, a divine exchange that was going on in which the old is gone and up comes the new because of Jesus Christ. Can you say a great big amen? So I thought I would give you just a moment. I wanted to tell you because I know that some of you will hear the word sacrament and go, Pastor, you flip that word around all the time and I don't even know I know what it means, so let me give it to you. You can look, again, go to the app if you want. It should come up on the screen. Let me give you a couple of them. What is a sacrament? All of these are just definitions that I want to give to you. Short definitions. Here they go. What is a sacrament? It is an ordained symbol, a vital and essential means by which Christ has said he will be present to the church and will sustain the life of the church. Look at that again. Ordained symbol, a vital and essential means by which Christ has said he will be present. Everybody say, he will be present. He will be present to the church and will sustain the life of the church. Secondly, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. We often use that. Theological realms will often say that and make it easy for people to remember it's an outward sign of an inward grace. Outward sign. Bread. Wine. Water. It's an outward sign of an inward grace that has taken place or is taking place thanks to Jesus Christ. It's a means of grace. That is a physical means. The next one. A means of grace. That is a physical means through which God's saving grace flows. The water baptism and Eucharist. You might say it's an earthly sign, a sacrament is, an earthly sign that points to a heavenly reality, a signpost pointing us to God. These are signs, they are symbols, but they are so much more that point us to God. Perhaps this definition is one that you might be able to grasp. It's a, sanct a sacrament is a sanctified sign, a sanctified sign within the church which itself points to the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me break this down for you just a second. So in water baptism, water baptism is that sanctified sign. We will be having water baptism here on Easter Sunday as we do each and every year. And then we also have it again uh, later on in the fall at the very least. But that will be coming up, and we'll have a, a class. And if you have not been baptized in water, I pray after this service that you will go. You know what? I've made a decision for Jesus Christ. I've never been baptized in water. I need to be baptized in water. And you will have a greater appreciation for it, even by the end of today. Water baptism is that sanctified sign which points to the initial inward saving work of the Holy Spirit purchased by Christ's body and blood. It's a sanctified sign which points to an initial inward saving work of the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist, see, we just do water baptism one time. We do it that inward, that inward initial. We just do it one time. But the Eucharist is something that we continue to do over and over and over again. And I want to let you know that in the early church, they did that at least, they did that at least weekly. Scriptures reveal they were so serious and took. The, the, the sacrament and the institution instituted by Christ so seriously. 
and understood that it contained so much real presence of God that they said, we have to have this. It became like the manna in the wilderness in which the children of Israel ate. We spoke about that. Jesus spoke about it in John 6 in our reading today. To partake of that regularly. So within the church we understand that the Eucharist is that sanctified sign which points to the ongoing inward saving work of the Holy Spirit purchased by Christ's body and blood. Another definition I would give to you is this. It's a mystery rooted in God's grace through which His power flows to change us. Another one that I could give to you, and I, I'm very quick with these because they're on the, the app. You can look them. If you don't have it this morning, you can look at this afternoon. Another definition for a sacrament is God's mysterious saving power hidden from our natural senses. There's a word known as mystagogy or mystagogy, however you would like to pronounce it. But it's the church's traditional way of revealing it to our mind and the spirit. Sacraments, I'll give you another one. Sacraments were instituted by Christ and they convey grace directly into our souls. In particular, water baptism through water and the Eucharist through bread and wine. I want to take a moment, I thought I would take a moment to stop and talk about what are sacraments and what might be understood as sacramentals. Sacraments and sacramentals. Sacraments were instituted by Christ. Sacramentals have been instituted by the church. Let me give you a little bit of an understanding of that. Sacraments were instituted by Christ and they convey grace directly into our souls. Sacramentals are instituted by Christ's church and they convey grace indirectly into our souls by leading us to devotion and providing us an occasion when we may respond to God's grace. Let me give you some examples of sacramentals. We've talked about sacraments. We've talked about the, the water and water baptism. The Eucharist, the communion, the bread and the wine. But let me give you some sacramentals which are instituted by the church. And here are some of them. Making the sign of the cross. How many of you, ever, how many of you grew up in a domination where you made, it, made the sign of the cross growing up? Let me see your hands. But some of you have. Yeah, some of you grew up in that. Let me just give you a little sign. I hope you understand that. That's what we call a sacramental. It was instituted by the church. Why was it instituted? Why? To convey grace indirectly into our souls by leading us to devotion and providing us an occasion when may, we may respond to God's grace. In other words, there, from, from, the, from the earliest of years, the sign of the cross would be made and it would be taken, especially in the Eastern Church today, it is taken and the, the three fingers, the thumb and the, the, the pointer finger and the middle finger, they come together to represent the Trinity. And the other two fingers go into the palm. And when they go into the palm, they are there representing both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so when what, what the sacramental is, it's a way of drawing us into closer devotion. It is not something that Jesus himself said, do this, but he said, hey, look, I want, he said, I'm going to allow this within the church. It is a sign in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that do for Christians? See, this was long before the Roman Catholic Church, and we may not understand that. Long before the Roman Catholic Church, the church was doing this. And it did it as a way for two things. One was to show everyone else, hey, I'm a believer like you in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Another thing it did was drew them into devotion to make sure that they constantly understood every good and perfect gift comes from above. So that even, listen to this, another sacramental is praying your prayers before your meals. How many of you pray your prayers before meals? Let me see your hands. That's a sacramental. You're lifting up, you're giving thanks. What are you doing? At that point in time, you are recognizing every good and gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. What are some of the other sacramentals? How about the liturgical calendar of the church? Celebrating Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Ash Wednesday, Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. They draw us into the life of Christ, remind us of the life of Christ through each of these things. Bible reading and Bible study are sacramentals. Our posture in prayer is a sacramental. 
What are some of those? What are some of them? You can think of what some of the postures are, can't you? Kneeling, bowing. Should I do it? Prostrate before the Lord. Those are postures. They are sacramentals in our prayer times together. What do each of those do when we do them? You know what they do. When you do it, it is drawing you into a more devotional understanding and appreciation for Christ and what He has done for you in your life. Some churches even use sacred images. You say, we wouldn't do that. I beg to differ. You're doing it today. Would you look you and you look this way, you and you look that way. What do you see? You see windows. You see sacred images. What are they meant to do? They are meant to draw attention to Jesus Christ. You look over here. If we look over here, we see this one right here and we see the birth. Next we see the baptism of, of Jesus. Next we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We come back here and we see Jesus on the cross. Here we see him at his resurrection in the middle one. And then here we see him at his ascension. Sacred images. What, what are they meant to do? Do you worship them? No. You don't worship them. But you see them as a devotional tool, a sacramental through which you can draw closer to Jesus Christ. I wanted to give us an understanding. just felt like we needed to get that because so many times we're looking at other denominations and, and other Christians. Watch this. Christians. And we will often slam them for the very things that we do ourselves. We just do differently and don't know it. But sacraments are not an end in themselves. They are means to an end. In other words, this, listen, our ultimate longing and encounter is not with baptismal water, but with the risen Lord who has ordained that he will be present in the water with us. Our ultimate longing and encounter is not with bread and cup. You don't just get up here and go, I think I want the glass with the, with the juice in it. I want the glass. I can't wait until I get that cup. I can't wait until I get that plastic cup. No, that's not it. What our ultimate longing is recognizing that it's not the bread and the cup, but with the risen Lord who has ordained that He will be present with us in the bread and the wine. In baptism, we are united with Christ in His death and resurrection. That's the reason we teach our we teach our catechumens, we teach our children and our adults that are going to be baptized. We teach them the understanding of going down. Your life is like here. You're on a cross. You're going down with Jesus but you're being resurrected to new life. That's what the baptism does. In the Lord's Supper, in the Lord's Supper, we meet, we commune with Jesus. That's why one of the reasons we, that's why we sing, your presence is heaven to me. Often I'll have Pastor Kevin do that song, during communion, your presence. He said, why? Because Jesus said, my presence is going to be with you. And there will be particular times where I want to manifest my presence to you in a powerful way. We understand like the apostles and the early church fathers that Jesus said he would be present in an especially tangible way when the saints meet together for the Lord's Supper. That's why in the early 1900s, I know that many of you may, may not be a part of this denomination, but early in the 1900s on December 24th, even one of the founding fathers of this denomination Bishop J. H. King of the International Pentecostal Holiness Church wrote with a grievous heart that he was disappointed that ordained pastors had lost the awe of the saints coming together to meet with the ascended Christ for the Lord's Supper. On a December 24th issue in which he wrote that and he mailed that out and entered into the pastor's homes and entered to them and said, there is a grievousness in my spirit because we have lost the awe of Jesus being present in our midst in a very real way that He said He would be in. Long before the New Testament books were written, before any churches were built, before the first disciple had died as a martyr for the faith, the Eucharist was the center of the life of the church. St. Luke sums it up this way in the Acts of the Apostles. 
He said, and they devoted themselves to the early church, to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. The first Christians, you might say, were Eucharistic by nature. They gathered for the breaking of bread and prayers. They were formed by the Word of God, the apostles' teaching. That's what we teach, even as we're teaching this sermon today. And when they met as a church, their worship culminated in fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia, or communion. The Eucharist was the center of their life for the disciples of Jesus. Jesus wants there to be a deep physicality to our faith. That's why he gives us these things. We often look at it and say, well, that sounds super mysterious. Let me tell you something. The mystery of God coming in the flesh is the greatest mystery of all. It is the incarnation of God in matter, in matter, the dust that's come together in the person of Jesus Christ, a body, Jesus said, thou hast prepared for me. So the Lord's Supper is not just an act where the bread and the wine are simply symbols. They are indeed symbols, but even more. They are a means to which Christ has ordained to convey directly His ongoing saving grace to us. And that's where we come to John 6, which we read this morning. Jesus said to them in verse number 53, He said, Verily, verily, I, true, I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true blood, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. It didn't sustain them. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Lord's Supper is not just an act where the bread and the wine are merely tokens. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said this on the night of the Passover. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper is not just a memorial, though it is that. To the contrary, in the language of the Apostle Paul, the Lord's Supper is a meal in which we are in communion, koinonia, fellowship with Jesus' body. When we take the cup, we enter into fellowship with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 16 says this, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there are some instructions because Paul has recognized that there's a Corinthian church that loves Jesus, they are in love with Him. And they love getting together for what are called these agape feasts. And these agape feasts are where they bring food in and they have bread and they might have some, something else, some kind of uh, a, a wine or some kind of meat and other things that they would have. And there were actually individuals that when they came to these agape feasts, they were getting drunk. They were coming to the church area where the church was going to gather. Maybe it was in a house. And they were actually getting drunk. The Apostle Paul has to correct them and say, you need to understand the body of the Lord. You need to discern the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says to them, for I received, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after saying, the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Yes, it is a memorial, but it is so much more. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then he gives them in the warning and instruction. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. When we look at the Eucharist, it's that sanctified sign which points to the ongoing inward saving work of the Holy Spirit purchased by Christ's body and blood. When you think of the Eucharist, perhaps it would help for you to think back to the Old Testament days where the children of Israel partook daily of the manna because they understood that it brought sustenance to them, life to them. But the most important thing to understand and take away from today is, Pastor, what do you want me to take away? I want you to take away this. Christ desires to be present with his church across the entire world, both in heaven and both on earth. And he has instituted, Christ has instituted that specifically and especially he will be present to us in our times where we gather in communion with one another and communion with him. So, Pastor, I don't understand there is to, to know about sacrament. Welcome to the club. We're all, many of us are simply stepping, taking ankle deep steps, perhaps moving the knees and beyond. But what I want you to recognize is this, is that Jesus instituted these. These were not even instituted by the church, but by Jesus Christ himself. That's why I have a friend that will often say that the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist is the meal that heals the meal that heals. I would ask that the Holy Spirit would help us to begin to understand that what we don't understand is all right. But we do want to begin to understand and appreciate this strength. Lord, we come to you and we recognize that we don't know all things. We don't understand all things. But we do believe that there is a river whose streams make glad, whose streams, whose streams, whose streams make glad the city of God. And Lord, we want to make sure that in our own hearts and our own lives that we don't, we're not those people that are not deserting the body of Christ and the blood of Christ when we come before you in our times of communion. So Lord, we say these words like that gentleman in the Bible and the Gospels. We believe. Help thou our unbelief. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And everyone said together, Amen and Amen. Pastor Kevin and his team are coming up. I want to ask if our local church administrative council members would come and join me at the front. Our ushers are getting into place. you will notice that there are two individuals that used to be a part of the LCAC that are sitting out there with you and two individuals that used to be sitting out there with you who are now up here. We welcome Mrs. Crystal Fields and also Mr. Christian Sessions who are the newest members of the local church administrative council from last week's business meeting. I want to ask you if you would to stand. Close your eyes for a moment. The gentlemen upstairs, if they will, put the words of this song on the screen. Your presence is heaven to me. Pastor Kevin, sing the verse, please. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? That's his love and beauty and his word. Nothing in this world can satisfy Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry Your 
also after supper say this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place today Apostle Paul said discern the body discern the presence of Jesus Christ Today, if you're in this place today, it's open communion, which means that you can't come and receive of, of the Lord's Supper. But it also means this. It means that if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your personal Lord and Savior in your life, we want to give you that opportunity to do that right now before you would step to this altar and receive the sacrament. So if you're here today, I just want you to know that Jesus Christ shed his blood for you. His body was beaten and broken for you. And yet his presence is here today. He died on the cross, was laid in the grave three days. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. And then he ascended into heaven. But he said, I, I'm still going to be present with you. To be present with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to be especially present when my church gathers together and they partake of that which I have instituted. So if you're in this place today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity today and ask everybody to join with them. Pray this prayer out loud. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending the blood of life the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I receive you into my life today. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of all of my sin and all of my unrighteousness. I will serve you from this day forward through the power of the Holy Spirit. In your name I pray, Jesus. Everybody sit together. Amen and amen. I want you to look at me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today and you've asked Jesus Christ in your life, I want you to know that you're welcome today. You're welcome at this altar to come and to take the elements back to your seat and hold them until everyone receives it together. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, it's very important that you let us know that you made that decision. There's a connect card in the pew pocket in front of you. Let us know you made a decision for Jesus Christ today. You can do it on the app if you'd like the bottom of the sermon notes. Praise team is going to continue to lead us. The ushers are going to direct you. As you're coming, would you come and take the elements, hold them as you return to your seat, and hold them until everyone gets served, and then we will partake of them together. It's like you, Lord, and all the earth. And I just love the beauty of the earth. For those of you who there are elements here for you as well. They're on the table. So they're going to be able to serve you. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry.
presence. For that, Jesus, you are most welcome here. We partake of the cup together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Would you just begin to pray in your own way right there? Thank the Lord both his body and his blood. Holy Spirit, we thank you today for illuminating our minds, our hearts, illuminating the Word of God. Lord, where we are infants and babes in certain streams, Lord, we ask that you will enable us to go from walking in ankle deep to where we're able to move to knee deep and waist deep and swimming in the understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Lord, as we leave this place today, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit Enlightened by the bread and the wine to carry out what you want us to carry out this week. Each of us have different assignments. Each of us will go out and do different things for your glory and for the expansion and enlargement of the kingdom of God on earth. We've been empowered to do just that today. And for that, we are thankful. Eucharist. Thanksgiving, we are thankful. In Jesus' name we pray and together everyone said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Very quickly, while you're remaining standing, Brother Michael Couillard, Sister Mary Ellen. Lord, we thank you for that. 
God became flesh. But Lord, you turned around after your resurrection and you said these words. You said, now I send forth you. I send forth you because all power has given, been given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and commanding them, teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. Let baptism be a part of what you do in this church, the healing waters of baptism. Let the Lord's Supper be a part of what you do at this church. Let the preaching and the teaching of the Word be a part of what you do. You are an incarnation, as it were. You are a continuation of the incarnation. You are continuing on, and you are taking God's Word to this congregation. And Lord, as we stretch forth our hands towards this couple, we anoint them today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we also not only anoint them, but we cast our prayers towards you for that congregation that is hurting, but is going to be welcoming to this pastoral couple that is going to come to minister the life of Jesus Christ to them. So Lord, this day we pray that you will take and you will, for the season, for whatever season it is, you know how long that season will be. And only you know that season. But for at least this season, you have called this couple to return there. And Lord, as they return there, may that congregation be receptive of the ministry and the word and the love of this couple. And that this couple not only minister out of hurt, but minister out of the hurt that's been healed. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we commission this couple. Together, God's people said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Would you put your hands together and bless the Lord? Just turn around. Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, give God some praise. Amen and Amen and Amen. It is not an easy thing to do what this couple is going to be doing. But they have our prayers. You have our prayers going with you. And here's what we want to do, guys. I want you, if you will, to kind of make a beeline. If you need to grab your Bible or just leave your stuff, but make a beeline to the back. And you folks, that congregation needs a pastor and it needs a pastor's wife. And they need him so quick, they need him next Sunday. So this is their last day. This is an opportunity for you to shake their hand. Thank them for their ministry here. Mary Ellen has been a part of the praise team and a part of the choir. We're going to miss you both. But we commission you and send you forth as the Father has sent the Son. The Son has so sent you. So I'm going to ask you if you would go stand out in the lobby. Let's give them one more great big God bless. You. Amen. I thank you for your patience today. If you would just be seated for another moment as Madison as uh, Madison comes to share. Is that correct? Guys upstairs. you to bring your young people um, to that event. The Unaltered Tour is going to be here on Wednesday, March 4th um, at 7 p.m. I was telling Miss Debbie last week, she was telling me that March 4th is her birthday. And I said, that is such an awesome birthday because March 4th is both a date and a command. March 4th. So, March 4th, your young people here to the Unaltered Tour. Um, I know Pastor John has been mentioning this is a big event, such a great event for the youth to be a part of. 
Um, there's also going to be breakout sessions for the parents, which is so important in this digital age, social media age, that we have understanding that and parenting through that. Um, but there's also room for um, volunteers. So um, if you're interested in volunteering for that event, be sure and see Pastor John. He's not here today, so you can see me today about it um, or next week when you see him. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here today. I am Madison Agostini, and I'm the Connections Director here at Stedman Beach Church. And if you are visiting for the first time, uh, we encourage you to fill out the Connect card that's in the pew pocket in front of you, or you can follow the QR code that's on the front of your bulletin, and that will take you to our church app. And you can fill out that Connect card in just a few seconds, real quick and easy. Um, they say that people go where they feel welcome, and they stay where they feel valued. So we hope that you feel welcome here and that you'll give us an opportunity to make you feel like a valued member of our congregation. We have an event also coming up soon on March 15th for anyone that is new or fairly new or looking to get further plugged in with our church. We have our mini mixer event on Sunday, March 15th, following the 10 a.m. service. Um, it's a lunch, and it's an opportunity for you to get to know our pastoral staff um, and the rest of us here that serve at the church in various capacities. We'll introduce ourselves to you and let you know about everything that we have going on here at the church, what we believe, why we believe it, and how you can be a part of it. So that's a really great event. We encourage you to sign up for that. Um, you can sign up for that through um, the church app as well or on our website. Um, Pastor Allen mentioned um, coming up this Easter Sunday is a water baptism service. And I think how awesome to be water baptized on an Easter Sunday. There have been millions of people, you know, across generations that have been baptized on Easter Sunday. And to get to be a part of that is awesome. So if you have not been water baptized and you would like to, this is your next opportunity. Sign up again through the app or on our website. And we'll get you more information about the class and where to be and when and all that. I know that a lot of you have been coming and participating in our Christian Men's Basketball League um, that's here out of Stemmon PH Church. We're having such a good time with that. Um, it's so much fun on Saturday nights. On the back of your bulletin is always the schedule for the next game. So um, our next game is Saturday at 7 p.m. And we welcome you to come and take part in that with us. Um, there's concessions available, and it's just an awesome time of fellowship with those of us that attend this church and then also those the churches that we're playing against. So again, I just want to thank you for being here today. I hope that you felt welcome and blessed by our service, and have a great week. Good morning. My name is Jim Dill. On behalf of the local church administrative council, I want to say thank you for coming today. Um, as the ushers are coming forward to collect this morning's ties, whether you're a longtime member or a first guest, we appreciate you coming. We do hope that you've enjoyed the service and you feel welcomed here. I do want to emphasize something that Madison spoke to, which is those connect cards in front of you in the pews. If you're a first-time guest, if you've been here two or three times, make sure you fill those out. It's a way for you to communicate with the church to let us know you're here, allows us to reach back out to you. It's very important. It's a way we can connect with you. If we can go to the Lord in prayer before we connect or before we collect ties this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for the service today. Thank you for everyone in here. We ask that you um, have your hand upon each and every person present here today. You bless them, protect them as they go forward this week. Lord, we ask that those, as we collect the ties this morning, that we use those ties to glorify and honor your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
had to be done with the house of Lord today. Come on, stand with us this morning. I just want to remind you as well, that's the chair we to remind you. Also, I ask Wednesday services coming up, not this much, but the following. It's going to be time with this congregation to come together and we spend time in prayer. Part of our, most of our congregation will be in here. There will be a few groups that uh, meet in small groups that are second grade and under will meet in their respective classes or whatever every morning next year. I want to say today, we're glad that you're in the house of the Lord. I want you to go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Serve somebody this week. Amen? Have a great week. God bless you. Don't forget to shake hands with Reverend Michael and Mary.